Hello everyone, welcome to the panel discussion about the film, The Dark Body. We're delighted to have your participation and engagement. And I would like to introduce um, our first speaker who's going to provide us with an introduction for the evening, Kimokeo Kapahulehua. Makamakai o kapakalaye, e kumu, e kumu ya maluku, ina ha kapu nu yo wahune la ye, e anue, e anue, ko e ko e valeno e. E a ye ke kanaka e kumu maluku, e anaya wakawa. Ayano kaukla o kale o e ano e valeno e Aloha, my name is Kimoki Oka Paolihoa. I'm the president of Ao Ao no Loka Ia o Maui, Maui Fish Pond Associations of Maui. We'd like to welcome you to the Doc Harvey film. This traditional chant I just did for you was asking permission for the people of the heaven Napoi Kalani, people of the ocean, Napoi Kamawana, people of the land, Napoi Kuhunua. And in this permission, we're telling them that we're coming and we're doing this special project called the Dark Hobby. And they say to us that I give you the heavens, Malama Nakalani, take care of the heavens. I give you the ocean, Malama Nakamawana, take care of the ocean. Malama Kaina, take care of the land. Most importantly, we also address them as Napoi Kalani, the people of heaven, Napoi Kamawana, people of the ocean, Napoi Konoa, people of the land. And in Dark Hobby, we ask you, Napoi Kamawana, the people of the sea and the ocean, please take care of them. We give them as your gift and care for them. Welcome to the Dark Hobby film panel discussion this afternoon. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Uh, my name is Jeannie Dodds. I'm the Creative Engagement Director for the Endangered Species Coalition. And I'm gonna moderate this evening's panel. I'm coming to you from Whidbey Island in Washington State, and I have a very bright sunshine on my face, so I'll try to sit in a good spot. <laughs> Which is the territory, the traditional territory of the Swinomish Nation, the Snohomish, nation, the Squamish and the Lower Skagit nations. My background is in researching the illegal wildlife trade and the intersection of the trade and visual art and how art can be used as a mechanism to um, inform consumers of the trade um, and prevent biodiversity loss. Um, I'm really honored to be moderating this panel and introducing our guest speakers, our guest panelists. I'll begin by introducing Lisa Bishop. Lisa Bishop is the president of Friends of Hanuma Bay, a 501c3 organization, which was founded in 1990, supporting the best stewardship of Hanuma Bay. Lisa is a champion of grassroots advocacy and citizen science for ecologically sustainable tourism, she was instrumental in Hawaii's enactment of the world's first ban on the sale of sunscreens, which contain reef toxic chemicals, which sparked an international movement to conserve the biodiversity of fragile marine environments. Thank you, Lisa, for being here. I'll next introduce Kimokea Kapo Lehua, who gave our beautiful introduction at the beginning. He is an esteemed kapuna working with the land and the people, including the fish people, for decades. In 2004, he was named Volunteer of the Year by the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation for helping protect, preserve, and promote the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary. The Kimokeo Foundation is a lasting legacy to perpetuate Hawaiian culture. 
Kimokeo does tireless service for the community and for resources from outrigger Hawaiian canoe voyaging to revitalizing an ancient fish pond and educating thousands about Hawaiian culture. He is a force of nature. Thank you for being here. With on the screen with Kimokeo is Robert Wintner. Robert Wintner is also known as Snorkel Bob. He's, which is uh, Hawaii's largest reef outfitter. For many years, Robert has been lead dog on the campaign to end the aquarium trade in Hawaii. He is dedicated to the global campaign for reef recovery. Wintner's 20 books, which include five volumes of reef photography, are recognized for excellence. His fiction has appeared in the Hawaii Review and Sports Illustrated. And his novel, In a Sweet Magnolia Time, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize and a Penn Faulkner Award. Thank you, Robert, for being here. Thank you. Welcome. Um, we have Paula Faust, who is the director of The Dark Hobby here this evening as well. She's directed many films, including No Asylum, The Untold Chapter of Anne Frank's Story, which is based on the recently discovered letters of Otto Frank and Frank's father. Paula produced and co-directed with Academy Award nominee William Haugsey, The Song of the Dunes, Search for the Original Gypsies. She directed and produced Not in God's Name in Search of Tolerance with the Dalai Lama and authored the book Not in God's Name, Making Sense of Religious Conflict. She also directed and produced Naked in Ashes, a critically acclaimed theatric theatrical documentary on India's yogis and produced and directed Origins of Yoga, Quest for the Spiritual, and co-authored the book, Shiva. Thank you so much, Paula, and thank you for inviting me to be here this evening, especially. I've got everyone? Okay, great. So what we'll do next is we'll proceed to ask the panelists questions, and um, we'll open the door to a really great dialogue about this um, powerful and so timely and important film. So first of all, everyone, could you please tell us about your life experiences and what about those experiences led you to actively protect Hawaiian reef wildlife? Well, I went snorkeling uh, 17 years after I'd been in a beautiful bay on the Big Island where we used to snorkel every morning. And this was about, I'd say, 2013. And there were just not any, hardly no fish in the water whatsoever. And I went back in the store to return the snorkeling equipment to the snorkel bobs. And I said to the girl at the counter, what happened to all the fish? She said, well, that's what our boss always says. You know, he's been writing books about about this, about the fact that so much reef, so many of the reef wildlife are missing now. And she pointed to this whole bookcase there. And I went over and I took one down and I, I started looking at the gorgeous photographs uh, that Robert Widner has taken through the years of reef wildlife in Hawaii. So I got introduced to him and I found out what had been going on as far as a collection of reef wildlife for the aquarium trade. It seemed like it was a very important subject for a film, and that was the genesis of the project. Would anyone else like to speak to the experiences that you've had that led you to protect Hawaiian reef wildlife? I'll pitch in on this. Um, when I uh, first arrived in Hawaii, um, it was to be in the charter boat business, uh, running tourists to Molokini Crater, uh, and it, it was quite stressful and difficult. Uh, in fact, I wrote a novel about that, and it's just re-released. It's called Roll Away, and it, it, it was one of the most uh, challenging tests of my life, and one of the things I took away from it were, were the moments, and they were extremely rare, uh, when it, it wasn't stressful, it was it was specifically in the water at Molokini Crater, where the, you couldn't hear the phone ring and you couldn't hear anybody yakking at you or making demands, and and the fish were so beautiful, graceful, and engaging that it was a great comfort and it touched my heart. 
and, and it stayed with me and it was a turning point. Um, and then learning not that many years later of what they were doing to these critters uh, wasn't right. It wasn't right. And I get compliments all the time for my, uh, my diligence and my perseverance. And it's just not the way it is. It's obsessive compulsive. It's not right. It had to change and we made it change. Fantastic. Thank you so much for these responses. So today I'm excited to announce that it's Endangered Species Day, which is a day that was started in 2006 by an act of Congress and the Endangered Species Coalition former director, or former um, education director, David Robinson was instrumental in starting this recognition, this day of recognition for endangered species. So it's a particularly fitting day to have this event um, with all the celebrations around the globe for endangered species happening today. Um, what I would love to ask all of you is if you could please share some examples of endangered species um, living in Hawaiian waters. We can certainly start with our Hawaiian monk seals, which are, um, they're about 1100 left in, in their natural environment in Hawaiian waters. And they are, um, they are, you know, clearly endangered. And one of the things that Hawaii has tried to do across all of its um, facets is to try to educate residents and non-residents, the visitors who come to Hawaii, to help protect endangered species like them. Um, our green sea turtles are, um, have been um, not quite as endangered as they used to be, but they're still uh, protected under the Endangered Species Act. So those are two right off the bat that I can mention. Like a whale. Humpback whales. Yes. Um, I, I have a, a, a classic example with specific regard to the dark hobby. Why has three species of Hawaiian seahorse endemic found nowhere else in the world? They're the biggest seahorses in the world. Uh, in a former administration, gubernatorial administration, the director of land and natural resources was a card carrying aquarium collector. Um, these three species of Hawaiian seahorse are not only endangered, they're listed on the CITES, that's C-I-T-E-S, the, uh, don't tell me, Convention for International Trade on Endangered Species. They're all listed verging on extinction. Yet aquarium collectors and aquarium uh, wholesaler in Honolulu was paying homeless people to go and catch them in an estuary and he'd pay them $40 each for them. Well, that's big dough if you're homeless. And then this dealer would sell them to private collectors or to public aquariums uh, to put on display. And that was the end of their natural life. Uh, and it was probably the end of their life entirely in no short order. Uh, this, this is illegal. And the response to the challenge of legality from DLNR was, that's the Department of Land and Natural Resources, a Hawaii government agency was, we have no evidence to that effect here in Hawaii. We've gathered no data on that, so we don't really know. Does that sound familiar? Uh, and I hope to say that this, this movie and recent uh, court developments, are gonna put an end to it, and that's how it should be. Thank you so much. Yeah, the thing that always stands out to me about Hawaii is how many endemic, unique species there are in the state and in the, the whole chain of islands and how precious those wildlife are. Uh, thank you for those examples. Um, next question is, a framing for the next question is to talk about how our incredible panelists who bring different backgrounds and perspectives about protecting reef wildlife which, are, which include perspectives from business, from advocacy, from academia, from many other perspectives. Um, and when we work collaboratively with decision makers and organizations and businesses and scientists, um, that can help to inform policies that inspire innovation. So I would love to ask you all to please speak to the importance of developing these kinds of collaborations across disciplines. 
I think, uh, Jeannie, it's important that uh, working with uh, local communities is important to bring some concern. Um, when we talk about endangered species, we also have to talk about uh, overfishing, you know. So culturally, uh, we have some fish that we catch uh, for the families and everything, and even for the market. And these are done by a uh, uh, kapu system where we don't overfish and making sure that we have enough fish to catch, you know. So we traditionally still catch the uh, akule, um, surround the fish, they're called mackerel, and uh, those are only catch seasonable. So culturally, uh, we've been doing that for a long time when they're seasonable. But now when we get to uh, the wildlife and everything, um, for us, you know, aquarium fish has never been something we collect. We never did collect aquarium fish. But we do what we call sustainable fishing. Uh, being the president of the fish pond, um, ancient fish pond raises the fish. And as you get abundance in the pond, you harvest the fish accordingly to feed the, the people in the village. Uh, today, it's uh, difficult to do that because uh, we're impacted by uh, a lot of other population that goes and overfish. So I think that for us, uh, making sure that uh, culturally we follow the moon calendar when time to fish, you can fish, and when time not to take, not to take. So we have a, a way of looking at the moon calendar, when to fish and when not to fish. But in the moon calendar, we do not have any of this endangered particular deal. It's really to maintain when you should catch it, have it always available throughout the years, you know. So I want people to know that. Uh, as, as Hawaiians, we have a way of, um, you know, fishing and when not to fish so that we have enough fish then. But it's difficult now. We have uh, in integration of uh, other type of uh, uh, people that come in and take and overtake. So we need to be very careful of that. And uh, looking at the endangered species is because the count is low. So we got to stop and not to take no more. You know, and and there might be a time like what Lisa was saying that, you know, that we have abundance of turtle, but still um, we have to work together as a government and people to figure out how we're going to do that to go take them off the list. And it's not an easy thing because we're afraid that now they're going to be overtaking it. And when you look at the monk seal, he's looking at the seahorse, uh, look at Hawaiian Island humpback whale sanctuary was made because of not having enough whales. And uh, so there was a way to work together. I think it's important that we all work as a community and how to protect and how to save the species in the ocean. If I may add to that, um, it has been my experience working as, um, you know, working in the, um, environmental NGO um, circles here in Hawaii, we have a very strong grassroots organizational base um, all over, all of the islands. And we we work collaboratively. It doesn't matter whether you're on Maui or on Kauai. Um, our environmental and, um, and cultural strengths um, really unite us in this state. And we're very fortunate, I believe, in that aspect I know when uh, previously when I lived on the mainland, um, just trying to network or organize on things was so difficult there. But I think here, because we're all live within three miles of the ocean, we see it, we smell it, we hear it. It's part of our psyche and our soul. And if, if you're transplants or if you were born and raised here, um, there's just so many people who really want to work together and who do successfully. And one of the things that we can do is we can ensure that um, our cultural practices and uh, current science get into the hands and the ears of the decision makers, whether they're our legislators or our governors or our council members and, and our school teachers, so that we're all working in the same direction. It's, it's been a very rewarding experience for me, and I look forward to continuing to work with uh, so many of the great environmental groups that we have here in Hawaii. I think Lisa made a great comment about uh, our local community and culture group. There. We can uh, put them micro uh, We have uh, Uncle Mackie Poi Poi on the island of Molokai uh, working with uh, protecting uh, 
that area and he did a great job and we have a group in Hanglei, they've done the same and uh Hui Malama Luku Ia is a state um, organization of fish ponds collectively working uh, with NOAA, with the state and the county and how to make permits uh, in a better streamline so we can work in uh, preserving, perpetuating uh, ancient fish ponds in the state. So I think you hit it on the real spot and uh, my compliments to you, Lisa, and Hanama Bay. Um, you guys did a wonderful job throughout the whole year and everybody in the state and the world has the benefit now to come and enjoy the jewels that you guys have saved for us. So great job. Yeah. Um, I'd like to add to that point um, that Lisa made about people caring in Hawaii. You know, Hawaii is a series of islands and um, it's it's all a reef community. Uh, reef community is below the surface and above the surface. And we had an interesting example of this uh, at a hearing on the big island. Um, another Two other stars in the dark hobby are Willie Kaupiko and his son Kaimi from the last working fishing village in Hawaii, um, Mililii. And uh, one of the aquarium collectors got up at this hearing and said, what are you guys from Mililii doing here? All we take is yellow tangs. You guys don't take yellow tangs. You want a pelo. We, a pelo is about a six, eight inch fish. It's got a long snout. Uh, we don't take a pelo. What are you trying to get in our way for? Why are you in our face? All we want is yellow tangs. Get out of here. And Kaimi Kaupiko said, yellow tangs graze algae and you take the yellow tangs and if the coral's covered with algae the opello won't come in connect the dots that was community communication in action and those guys don't care because they're in it for the bucks the aquarium collectors but we won the day so once again it, it's working for now we can never let our guard down it's a fantastic segue actually to our next question, which is I'm very excited to hear more about. Um, the legal ruling in January, 2021, which protects Hawaiian reef wildlife. Um, could you please speak to what the legal ruling means um, and the remaining challenges? Um, I can address that and I'll try to be brief. Um, the, <laughs> the challenge to the aquarium trade began in the Hawaii Circuit Court, I think it was in 2012, or maybe it was 2013, right in there. Uh, and um, we were advised that the, the case would lose, and it lost. It took two years to, for the appeal to go up to the uh, uh, ICA, Intermediate Court of Appeals, where it was tried again. Uh, the, uh, the lawyers, the attorneys pleading our case were both from Earth Justice. They were both excellent. Um, I'll think of their name, Carolyn Ishida and Summer Kapau Odo, really top-notch attorneys, um, two, two dynamic women who didn't miss a shot. Uh, we lost at the ICA as well as we were told we would do. At that time, Paul Achitoff was uh, the lead dog at Earth Justice in Honolulu. He said, we've never won anything until we got the Supreme Court. We got the Supreme Court in 2017. Summer Kapau Odo argued in front of the Supreme Court there and we won. And the big deal of that victory was the Supreme Court granted injunctive relief. We all had a steep learning curve on there, so I'll share. That means shut it down right now, pending environmental assessment. The state Department of Land and Natural Resources director, who was, uh, don't tell me, help me here, Paula, uh, Suzanne Case, 20 years executive director of the Nature Conservancy don't get me started, they scoffed at the Supreme Court ruling. It's the highest ruling in the land. And they still, the Supreme Court said, you cannot issue permits anymore. She said, fine, no more permits required. That's how we'll get around this one. And they continued to go out there. It took another three years. The lead guy at DAR in Kona said, this, this movie, The Dark Hobby, it's just a bunch of opinions and it's four years old. I'll tell you what else is four years old. This movie has been years in the making, four years old as well as the Supreme Court ruling. And it was only in the last few months that this Supreme Court ruling was brought up again to a circuit court. And the circuit court said, no, the Supreme Court ruling will stand because of COVID-19. The state was out of money. They couldn't make payroll. Payroll is sanctimonious in, in, in Hawaii. You must make payroll. They had no more money for another bogus EA, environmental assessment, and it's over. It's just that simple. So 
you know, thank God for blessings where you least expect them, but this was one and it, it's sticking for now, but there's big money in this. So look out, watch your back. <laughs> What's important, however, even though such wonderful conservation heroes struggled for so many years in Hawaii, fighting many, many legal battles and, and waging war, really, you have to say, to win um, the protection of, of for, re for reef wildlife. But yet, the public needs to realize how these fish are caught, um, how they're treated, and it has to become you know, known that these species are protected and everyone has to take part in, you know, if you see something happening, talk about it. And perhaps Robert, you could describe how the reef wildlife are caught and transported. Well, they're caught in, <clears throat> it, it, you know, there's so many stories we could go on all day. For example, some of the most hateful examples are when they emptied Kaneohe Bay on Oahu of uh, feather duster worms. They're beautiful, uh, polychaete worms that bore into the coral. They would take, uh, I, I accused them of, of, of prying them out with crowbars. They said, no, we don't use crowbars. We use broomsticks. Oh, pardon me. They took out hundreds of thousands. They hold. Yeah. They wholesale them for 35 cents each on their way to retail for $35 each. They're gone from Kaneohe Bay. How much money would it cost to reintroduce a species and what kind of clearance would that take? You can't undo the damage you've done. And um, they, they, they come in with what they call tickle sticks. They, they chase the fish out of their, their habitat. You know, the reason there's so many yellow tangs, yellow tangs are found all over the Pacific and Indian oceans, but the reason they love Hawaii is finger coral. Finger coral is found only in Hawaii. It is the, the number one favorite habitat for yellow tang. So we have a bunch of them. They come in and, and grab, they, they, they smash the coral, they break the coral, they walk on the coral, they drop anchors and chains on the coral and nets. Then the fish are caught in a net, they're put in a plastic can, they're rushed to the surface. There's such a thing called um, uh, uh, fizzing where they put a needle in the air bladder so they don't, if you're a scuba diver, you know, you have to wait for three minutes, hang out and decompress a little bit. It's not called decompression, it's called a safety stop to ditch nitrogen. Fish don't have that luxury. And a lot of times they're in too much of a hurry because we're burning daylight here. And hours, time means money. They rush to the fish to the surface. Then there's a bumpy boat ride back to the harbor. And then it's a series of traumas. We go over this in the movie, so I'm not gonna repeat what's already in the movie, but it's a bad deal. And 99% of all reef wildlife critters captured for the aquarium trade die within a year. And that's what the trade calls sustainable. That's why I have a hard time with sustainable. To them, it's a bottom line sustainability. Uh, it, it's an unacceptable level of destruction and it's over for now. Yeah, absolutely. I am always just absolutely floored by the immense harms of the trade and how it impacts wildlife and humans in so many different dimensions of harm. Um, and this is also another great segue to our next question, which has to do with how the reefs might heal, but if they are unable to do so, and if the fish populations do not return, what are the consequences of that? How does that affect the environment? How does that affect tourism? And how would that affect the Hawaiian economy? So if I may, um, corals are a sentinel species and um, so much in our coral reefs, um, you know, they are the rainforests of the ocean and about 25% of you know, ocean wildlife um, is found in our coral reefs. And around Hawaii, coral reefs are not just um, the foundation or, or the core of perhaps cultural practices, but they are also a, a reason for, um, for an important part of our tourism industry. And they also provide coastal protection for our homes and our businesses. And so um, 
living without our reefs and our corals in Hawaii would be devastating. And I think it would be, um, and, um, you know, Kimo Keo can speak much better about it from a cultural standpoint than I, than I can attempt to, but um, it would be a death knell to some very important basic tenets of Hawaiian culture as I understand them. Yeah, so Lisa, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, the coral is a very significant uh, part of our culture. In, uh, and it talks about it in the Kumulipo chant. We have uh, 2,000 lines talk about the coral being the habitat for everyone of the sea. And so the coral, the culturally and spiritually, is how we believe that, you know, the birth of the sea is the land of the life, you know, and life. So the coral is really important, uh, kokoa, and having everybody using it as a habitat. So any part of the coral is taken away, you take in the habitat for the people of the sea. So the coral is very important to us. Um, I have some, some bad news and good news. Um, and it, it's this, there are just a couple examples of, of species. Um, the state, um, not my favorite entity, especially in the executive branch these days, uh, but there were they had this um, really despicable um, habit and policy. If the aquarium collectors took all of a species, meaning you just didn't see them on a certain reef anymore, they would call it a species of concern. That was their soft talk for a terrible crime. And among species of concern uh, were the Hawaiian cleaner wrasse. It's endemic, it's, it's charismatic, it's irrepressible, it's a destination species, it's an amazing fish. It's purple, yellow, blue, uh, incandescent. And they took them all and they, in, in a cleaner wrasse, literally they set up cleaning stations and they plucked tiny parasites off the other fish. And after they took them all, <coughs> they had what was called parasite loading on these reefs all the other species began to suffer from paradise from parasite load, loading that's what happens a couple other examples teardrop butterfly disappeared from Puaco. um forceps and long nose butterfly fish disappeared on most kona reefs keep in mind um the hub of the aquarium trade in kona was the kona coast it's 135 miles of uninterrupted coral cover okay that's the bad news here's the good news when these species got blacklisted, you can't take them anymore, they came back. The ocean is resilient. That's not to say be careless or anything goes. We're very close to shutting, shutting it down. So we won a couple very close calls and that's why the, time, the timing of this, this whole chain of events is, it's blessed for now. I keep saying for now, don't let your guard down. So I just want to um, call attention to um, the audience. Um, if folks would like to drop questions into chat, you're more than welcome to do that. I'll ask one other question and then we'll start to take questions um, through the chat from the audience. Uh, Kim Okeo, how do you think that your community's Native Hawaiian cultural and spiritual uh, viewpoints and perspectives can inform the successful protections um, yeah, what can we learn? Well, I think, um, you know, Robert brought up a, a good thing about uh, the ocean is resilient and it can come back itself, you know, but uh, they don't need to get to that situation. If they um, know um, the kapu system and um, not to take when they're not supposed to take, you know, and knowing that when the fish is born into babies, that's not the time to take anything. So culturally, you know, a lot of uh, the fishing that the Hawaiians are doing, you know, uh, they're doing it uh, because they were taught by their their ancestors and taught by their kupuna, you know. But unfortunately, we get uh, a miss. Um, we don't have that um, opportunity just having our population now integrated with a lot of other population that not respecting our culture system or culture right so we um but uh, we can be resilient if we follow the couple systems and uh, certain parts of 
what Lisa brought up about the communities there are really strong communities are fighting and for their for their rights and especially like Molokai you know Molokai Momona you know um, they don't want us to do that they were not allowed to do that and we shouldn't let the people in Molokai have their reefs and because that's their way of life of getting their food and having outsiders to go and take their food from their own refrigeration is not the way to do that. And we need to show respect to these communities around that um, have a system put in place for themselves. We have it in Molokai. So, you know, respect Molokai and don't do that and respect their uh, way of life and uh, where they're getting the food and They've made it happen for themselves, and we we uh, we should be learning from some of these communities. Kauai is doing that, and I'm not sure. Um, some places in Oahu, um, look at uh, uh, Panama Bay. Panama Bay is, uh, she says, uh, 67 years. We all can go there and knowing that we're going to see a, abundance of fish because what they've done down there. So for us in Hawaii, uh, respect the culture, respect the practices that was given to um our people and uh, how they've done that and we can be resilient we can be resilient and today it's a different community but we still have to make sure that uh, we respect that and learn from it and uh and hopefully that take much more of hawaii and protect the wild fish you know yeah it was very well said Thank you so much. When we talk about we talk about the reef. You're looking at Molokai has the largest reef, um, miles and miles. You know, so we need to make sure that that whole thing is protected. And reefs in the West Maui, uh, South Maui, and uh, we just need to make sure that we can protect the reef and protect the habitat of all fish. Thank, Thank you, you. Kim. Um, I see a couple of really great questions that I would love to bring up from the audience. Uh, one question that I see that I think is really critical to talk about, especially because the consumer audience of uh, aquarium species is a major intervention point to reduce the trade. Uh, what can I do as a consumer, a voter, and a person who cares about fish, reefs, and oceans, but I do not live in Hawaii? And I would also add to that as how can people in Hawaii um, address those same topics to support uh, reducing the harm from the trade or reducing it, ending the trade? Um, I, I think step one is, is, is right in our faces and it's relax, enjoy yourselves, watch this movie, have a bowl of popcorn, socialize with your friends and let's get the word out. Uh, this question is a great question and it won't go away. It's been around for years and I, I actually get asked most by kids and kids are the best because they are a formidable force. And I say, kids, if you see an aquarium in a doctor's office or a restaurant or a bistro, have a word with the manager, have a word with the owner, say something and, and explain these fish came from uh, uh, Hawaii reefs. Uh, I have anecdotes I could go on and on about fish dying in aquariums in public places on the mainland. Uh, and, and it was sad, but it, 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 it came to um, making a difference because somebody saw them and said something. And I tell the kids, if they, not if they don't listen, make a scene, whine, stomp your feet, jump up and down and shout. That's what it takes. You know, this campaign's gone on for so many years, and I've always considered the Hawaii legislative and executive and judicial part of it the supply side. This is where it comes from. Don't forget the Philippines, Indonesia, and on around. Uh, Kenya, um, th they're all being trashed by these aquarium collectors. Uh, I, I look at the dark hobby as the demand side. There is a certain segment of aquarium hobbyists who don't care, who will respond to you. This is my money and I can spend it how I want and I enjoy it, so get out of my face. There's another segment of aquarium collectors who feels a little bit bad about it, but not as bad as they need to feel because those tanks need to come down. If you know somebody with a tank, say something, let them know. Nobody anywhere is growing these fish. A few in captivity, important stat. 
98% of all saltwater aquarium species are wild caught, 98%. So be diligent, keep your eyes open, share your thoughts. And it's a wonderful thing to behold these, these fish um, come to Hawaii and take pictures. That's what I do. Um, and it's a great thing. I see another really important question in chat. Um, what do you see as the long lasting impact if things do not change? And I just want to really briefly add that there was a, a report that came out in 2019 by the IPBS. That's another acronym that I'm not necessarily pulling to mind right now. The Intergovernmental Environmental Program, it's, it's part, it's connected to the United Nations. And they identified in the report that the number one driver of species decline was habitat loss with the number two driver being um, overconsumption. And overconsumption includes things like the aquarium drain. So I just wanted to throw that out as, as a huge impact. And I would love to hear what the panelists think about this question. I think the answer is fairly obvious here. If things don't change, it's a dead end street. Also, when you realize that so many fish species are, they're interconnected. And when you remove certain species from the hierarchy living on the reef, you're affecting who's above and who's below. You're affecting the food source. The balance that exists there is being wrecked and you're affecting the oxygen supply of this planet because the way that these these reef wildlife eat just the right amount of algae all the time to keep the balance perfect they eat it off the coral and it's just a perfect design nature has this wonderful ability to do things perfectly and sometimes human beings can get in the middle of it and we upset that balance so if we keep doing that to the reefs, we're causing more destruction. It's going to impact us worse and worse. It's yet another thing to worry about with the oceans. We hear a lot about the plastic. We hear a lot about overfishing and aquarium collection is another one of those things that it's important for us to keep, keep working, you know, to stop it. Absolutely. Here's a great question regarding the lack of tourism during the pandemic and how that has impacted the health of Hawaiian reefs. Uh, I'm in tourism. I I, I, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, well, I think that the COVID pandemic has been absolutely fabulous for the natural resources <laughs> in our state. I, 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 I sound really, you know, uh, uh, off kilter in saying that I know that our families in our state and all over the world have suffered tremendous losses uh, personally and economically, but I, I think in Hawaii for our natural resources, it has been a silver lining. And we know we have seen that in Hanauma Bay. Uh, for the first time last year, Hanauma was closed to visitors uh, for nine months. At first time in its history that it was closed to visitors. And we saw such an immediate rejuvenation in the marine ecosystems within the bay. You couldn't have paid a contractor to come in and do for Hanama Bay what nature did for itself. And so um, that, and, and we've seen that all over, not just in our marine environments, but in our hiking trails and our forests, I mean, everywhere. I think that um, those areas that have been um, um, subjected to stressors from over visiting, um, got a chance to take a break, and and you'll find that kind of reporting from just about Robert, just about every every one of our of our islands in the Hawaiian, um, in the state of Hawaii, uh, in Hanauma Bay. If it weren't for COVID, we wouldn't have been able to start the very first coral restoration project of one of the endemic species of corals in Hanauma Bay because the natural resurgence provided an opportunity to see that this is a great time to try the first coral restoration project there. So um, we know that tourism is coming back to the islands. We've 
already experiencing that. And we're hoping that the decision makers will embrace this idea of pivoting to more of a focus on the environment instead of only on the bottom line. And that um, education will um, improve for all of our visitors about how, reef etiquette, the importance of all of our natural resources, and that we welcome them to come and visit our state, but please try to leave it a little better than it was when you came. So it's, you know, tourism is with us. It's our number one industry, but I think it can be done smarter. And I'm hoping that our decision makers are learning that and are committed to make it happen in a smarter way for us. Uh, I, I'd like to add what um, Lisa said, and I, and I agree with her wholeheartedly, and I often speak against the green on this subject because uh, I'm in tourism. I've been in tourism for 35 years, and it's been very, very right. good to me. Uh, for years, Hawaii had 7 million tourists a year, 7 million visitors a year, and it was plenty. Everybody was doing great. Then it was 9 million, and it was a little bit uncomfortable, and then it went to 10 million, and it's not good. It's just not good. Um, and I like to share an experience with friends. I, I walked my dog on a particular beach in 2019 on July 4th, there were probably 15 or 1700 people on that beach. In 2020, there were 12 people on that beach on July 4th. It was beautiful, it was eerie, it was serene, it was Hawaii. And we need it back. And right. uh, it, again, it's lack of leadership at the state capitol. Uh, more, more, more is the mentality Hawaii used to be an exotic destination, and now it's crowded. Uh, what is a guy in tourism saying stuff like that for? Because it's the truth, and we need to get back. Uh, the simple fix is get rid of T T uh, TVR transient vacation rentals, get rid of VRBO, and get rid of timeshare. <laughs> if you come to Hawaii, you stay in a hotel and you eat in a restaurant, and that's the deal. And people have vacation condos where you can rent those, that's okay, but these other places, for decades, they were vacant part of the time. Now everything's full up all the time and it doesn't work. It's no longer a quality experience. And I would like to see uh, 3 million visitors a year fewer. Uh, and I think everybody will be happier and it'll be a better life for everybody involved. Yeah, thank you again for connecting across, you know, the, the conservation problems to community problems are certainly linked um, I'd love to turn the discussion over to Paula at this time to talk more about the film and tell people how they can become involved. Thank you. Uh, go to thedarkhobby.com. We have a lot of interesting material there posted. We have a petition to sign. There's a uh, link that says take action and you can go there and find ways that you can spread the word about protecting reef wildlife. Whether it's sharing on social media, some of the beautiful photographs that are posted there, whether it's um, sharing the news about the dark hobby film with people that you know, or with your family or watching it with others, having discussions. It's really a uh, time that we spread the awareness of what's happening, happening to reef wildlife and it's all over the world. It's in Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, wherever you may travel. It's um, a very, very nice time to be alive in the sense that there's so much technology and science that we can access now that lets us know about this beautiful world beneath the sea, beneath the ocean. You didn't used to be able to turn on a video screen, see these stunning images of reef wildlife. Now we can access that we don't have to have these creatures living in the glass you know in in a glass aquarium full of water and we've come to know a lot about the qualities that reef wildlife have they communicate they even sing and they make sounds and they make plans and they go hunting they recognize human faces. There's a lot of things to know now that uh, science is informing us about these creatures. So it's an exciting time for everyone, I think, to have more awareness about what's going on in the ocean and 
to save it for future generations. So please do go to the Dark Hobby website, thedarkhobby.com, and you'll see all of the um, ways to stream the film. It's on Vimeo, Voodoo, YouTube, uh, iTunes, Apple TV, and just let everyone know and, and share your opinion about it. Paula, well, may I also ask you to speak about the petition? The petition is on there, and if you can sign it, it would be wonderful. It's about uh, not collecting reef wildlife or not purchasing reef wildlife. And it just helps to build awareness because so many of us have never been uh, understanding how these fish were caught. We always loved looking at them. And now that we know how much stress they go through, uh, if you can sign the petition, we can limit the number of species that are, you know, no longer being, being in the ocean. So they're, they're endangered. So please go there and sign our, our petition. Thank you so much, Paula. I, I was, I've seen the film twice now and it's been more impactful just over time and thinking about everything that you speak about and it's a really amazing piece. So wonderful work and wonderful work to everyone that's part of it as well. Um, to close us out this evening, I just wanna say thank you so much to all of the speakers and then allow everyone just a moment or a minute or two to say any last thoughts that they'd like to share this evening or this afternoon. I'd also like to say that on the website, thedarkhobby.com, there's many wonderful partner organizations who are joining with us. And you can go to the link there and you will find out about the wonderful organizations that Jeannie and Lisa and Robert, everyone is a part of. And you can click and, and find all their information. And we're very, very thankful that we're all connecting together because we can do a lot more. We can amplify what we're trying to do as we protect reef wildlife, the ocean, and the reef. Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I would just like to say that uh, I feel very privileged to have been invited to be part of this, this panel today. And to me, it boils down to a simple thing, and it's doing the right thing. We can make a choice. We can choose to view marine wildlife in some place other than our private aquariums. And so we just ask people to watch the Dark Hobby film, talk about it, as Paula mentioned, amplify, amplify our voices, and, and take that one small step, simply make the choice not to collect saltwater aquarium fish, and you can be making such a big difference to marine ecosystems around the world. Thank you. Well, I would just like to thank everybody for watching. I'd like to thank uh, Jeannie for uh, moderating, uh, Jean, and, um, and thank you, Lisa, for your support. You made some great points today. I have uh, really special gratitude. Kimo Keo had to step out. He had another engagement. Uh, he's in big demand. He's a powerful guy, as you can tell. Special gratitude again to Kimo Keo and to Paula for putting this together. Uh, I feel just grateful for having connected those two. Love this movie from the first time I saw it. I got goosebumps. And uh, it, it's not only profound and consequential, it's fun. It's fun to watch. And the thing is, you know, there's so many movies out now that, that, that use carnage and gore and gross stuff. And sometimes they have to. We bent over backwards to, uh, to show the beauty that we're, we're, we're fighting to protect, to, to show the bright side. And I think the movie is just a wonderful success in, in, in that way. And I'm, I'm just really grateful for it. Thank you, Paul. I love it. All right. Yes, thank you all so much for, for being present, for the audience to be present this evening and just really welcoming you to 
share this panel discussion will, is being recorded and you'll be able to share it. Please share the links to watch the film. Please tell your friends and your family about it. The more people who are aware of the aquarium trade, the more likely it is that we'll swiftly bring it to an end. Um, any last words, Paula? I would love to have you take us out if you like. Uh, everyone, thank you for listening to the panel tonight. And thank you to our panelists and guests. Please do uh, go stream The Dark Hobby. Go to thedarkhobby.com and share the message about reef wildlife. Thank you. <laughs>